Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Now let us discuss what we have covered till now. If you look at the ontological questions, I mean we started with ontological questions, then we moved on to what ought to be okay, in the form of the social institution of science, I mean the, uh, the ethos of modern science uh, by Martin namely universalism, communism, disinterestedness and, uh, and organized skepticism. Okay? If you look at them and then the way we uh, move to the methods of science and the kind of methods of science that we have discussed, I mean inductivism, hypothesism and positivism. Okay? Now, from now onward, we will start discussing uh, the way post positivistic terms within STS, within philosophy of science, history of science, sociology of science. Okay? Then who are the prominent players, who are the prominent authors? Okay? Uh, 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 in the post positivistic terms. There, Karl Popper and Thomas Kuhn and also Paul Feyerabend, Lakatos is there and many, many others are there, but uh, for the sake of this course, the way we have designed, we will discuss Popper, Kuhn and Feyerabend. Okay? In fact, if you look at uh, the the controversies between Popper and Kuhn, uh, you will find that uh, uh, perhaps uh, the, the, the debates between uh, Popper and Kuhn are the most significant ones in the 20th century philosophy of science. In fact, these two paradigms of thought, they dominated not only the later half of the 20th century, but even in 2017. Okay? The debate is not over uh, even after that demise. Okay? And uh, they were excellent uh, historians and philosophers of science uh, uh, who could uh, uh, rule the world in terms of the methods of science, the perspectives on science and so on. If you, if I say Darwin, Charles Darwin provided a paradigm in the biological sciences, Freud provided a paradigm uh, uh, in psychology, okay? Marx provided a paradigm uh, in the humanities and social sciences, then Popper and Kuhn provided two paradigms of thought in science, technology and society studies, which are very dominant even today. Eh? And the way they tried to defend their uh, methods and the way the follow their followers also tried to defend their methods. Okay? Uh, and, the, and the critics too, you know, both Popper and Kuhn will find that uh, 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 even their critics they have not yet been able to uh, create walls so that uh, uh, they can be ignored even today. Okay? What we have done uh, uh, 
uh, I mean if you look at uh, uh, in the ontological questions we started with technology, science and the relationship between science and technology and the relationship between technology and science on the one hand and society on the other. Then we provided three models or three perspectives on STS okay? namely the linear model, the interactionist model and, uh, 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 and the embedded model. The, uh, the linear model suggests that you no know, science uh, leads to the development of technology, technology leads to the development of society, uh, whereas the interactionist model suggests that no society also leads to the development of technology and science as well. But there is a similarity between these two models that we have already discussed that both these models they treat science, technology and society as separate entities. whereas the embedded model suggests that the relationship between science and technology is symbiotic in nature. Both science and technology as two forces of production, they are not autonomous activities, they are not isolated activities rather they are very much a part of social formation. Okay. Thereby, we, say, we challenge the question the, the idea of technological determinism that um, technology determines our economic culture and polity or changes occur because of technological interventions and so on. Okay. Now, if you if you look at uh, that, that the kind of transition that we have made um, because of changes in the modes of production, because of the rise in our intellectual and political consciousness and so on. If you look at this, then what the kind of changes that we see today, I mean the, the cognitive and political changes, uh, they have uh, significant implications on the way we view suppose nature, culture, environment, health, agriculture uh, and so on. And from these ontological questions, we came to some normative questions in the, in the form of normative structure of science in the, in the form of institutional imperatives of science in the form of ethos of modern science uh, by, by Robert Martin. I mean ethos of science I mean uh, effectively toned complex of values and norms which is held to be binding on the man of science and these norms are expressed in the, in the form of uh, prescriptions, proscriptions, preferences and permissions. We have discussed this. I mean prescriptions when I say I mean a broad normative framework. Proscriptions are norms which are legally bound. Preferences are motivational norms, motivational ideals, motivational uh, values. Whereas, permissions they come under the institutional norms, institutional values, institutional ideals, I mean institutional mandates on the whole. And from there on what we try to do, uh, what we try to do that we try to delineate four institutional imperatives, four ethos of modern science namely universalism, communism, disinterestedness and organized skepticism. When we discussed Mertonian ethos of science, we mainly focused on the goals of what must be, what should be the objectives of science. Then this, that is why I said normative or prescriptive framework, pre prescriptive structure of science. Okay. Now, from the ontological questions to the, the normative question, now we are coming to the methodological questions. Okay. Now, the methodological questions that we see today, they are very important. But perhaps, perhaps among those four ethos of modern science, that is why I said earlier that universalism, communism and disinterestedness, they refer to the goals of science. Whereas, organized skepticism refers to not only the goal of science, 
but also a methodological rationale which is very important uh, uh, in the context of science and uh, and its practitioners okay i mean uh, you need to uh, temporarily suspend your judgment you need to push keep on postponing your judgment until and unless all facts are at hand and that's why science is distinct from all areas of human activity or um, creativity uh, because it possesses a method unit to it that is methodological as we have already discussed in the context of uh, the central tenets of positivism within the methods of science we have discussed inductivism hypothesism and positivism as we discussed that uh, uh, since the the uh, i mean uh, from 17th century till 19th century i mean these these three centuries okay were dominated by schools of inductivism as well as hypothesis i mean that is uh, it heralds the birth of uh, modern philosophy of science okay when you look at this okay and positivism is a 20th century phenomenon okay when we look at this okay as we have already discussed that uh, uh, no inductivism uh, uh, is rooted in empiricism again empiricism is rooted in experience okay uh, it always starts uh, i mean science must start with observation science must remain at the level of observation science must end with observation whereas in the hypothesis schema science starts only when we go beyond observation on account of which science becomes trans observational in nature in the context of hypothesis schema okay and and both uh, uh, why why it is trans observational in the hypothesis schema because hypothesis maintain i mean including rene descartes who said cogito ergo sum i think therefore i am i doubt therefore i am okay um, i mean my existence my own self is very much contingent upon the way i think the way i question the the way i doubt it is important to understand okay science always starts with a hypothesis for for descartes for cartesian philosophy of science but in the inductivist schema in the baconian model of science that uh, no science always starts with observation okay uh, uh, and these controversies remained for a, a long period of time and today also people all uh, even even scientists themselves they 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 argue it Uh, uh, either uh, uh, in favor of either of these uh, perspectives okay no no doubt about that okay and then what we uh, then wha- what we discussed that how inductivism looked at certainty and breadth as the hallmarks of scientific knowledge and hypothesis uh, hypothesis looked at uh, looked upon uh, novelty and depth as the hallmarks of scientific knowledge and i mean uh, when we say this okay then it becomes uh, 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 i mean hypothesis why they said that uh, no it must be novelty and depth it must be new uh, 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 and it must have deeper entities and processes uh, precisely because for them no observation is presuppositionless we'll come to this uh, we have already discussed this but again and again we have to come back to this point it is very important to understand this okay suppose if i say uh, as as i told you earlier that uh, suppose uh, this space in this space we also have electron proton but we simply cannot observe this we we deploy our a rational understanding or rationality to make these uh, uh, to to explain the existence of proton and electron even in this space but we just cannot observe it okay 
because hypothesis is grounded in rationalism, rationalism is based on reasoning capacity in this sense. And then what we, we, are, we, we tried to do is that from this we came to a stage where all methodological tenets characteristics were organized by the by the proponents of positivism. When whenever I, I, I come to uh, uh, whenever we, we try to discuss positivism, positivism must be discussed in a certain context of the transition from theological stage to metaphysical stage to positivistic or scientific stage. Theological stage suggests that changes occur because of the changes in the supernatural forces. Whereas, I mean you, uh, you, as you, uh, uh, you attribute any kind of change to changes in uh, the supernatural forces, you changes uh, in terms of uh, uh, I mean uh, not this worldly phenomena, but the other worldly phenomena. Okay which science does not believe in. And metaphysical stage suggests that no changes do not occur because of the changes uh, of uh, uh, supernatural forces, but changes occur because of natural interventions. Nature always dictates us to make change. Whereas, positivistic or scientific stage suggests that no, it is not simply nature dictates, but human action, human beings, human I mean social actors, okay, they determine what kind of nature we are going to have. Okay. That is why I, I, we discussed how there is a transition from faculty of contemplation to faculty of control. Okay. And uh, uh, we not only contemplate on nature, but also control nature. That is it. Okay. Then we discussed uh, central tenets of positivism. That uh, when I said, um, if you look at this uh, central tenets of positivism, that uh, methodological. Okay. That we said that uh, that science is distinct from all areas of human activity or creativity. Okay. Uh, uh, because it possesses a method unique to it. Why positivism? Under what circumstances positivism emerged? Positivism emerged, positivism stood squarely against uh, uh, the theology as well as metaphysics. Positivism emerged in the context of the industrial revolution, in the context of the debates on modernity, critical thinking, uh, reasoning capacity uh, and the capacity to interrogate, the capacity to pose questions. If I cannot question, then that is not the motto of science. The motto of science lies in the way I must be able to range questions, pose questions. This is very important. Okay? Then positivists are even even positivism uh, emerged in the context of challenging the dominance of religion uh, and especially. Uh, uh, in the context of the dominance of church in Europe. Perhaps, perhaps in India, we have not yet come to a point of this. Okay? Uh, uh, that way, uh, oh, oh, but it does not imply that there is only one form of enlightenment. Uh, we, we see multiple modernities, alternative modernities, that is a different, different uh, story altogether. I mean, that is a different discourse altogether, we will see. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, in the context of post-structuralism, post-modernism, uh, we'll see. Uh, we always witness that how there there is no the enlightenment, the modernity. Rather, we we may say that the kind of enlightenment you Europe witnessed, uh, maybe Latin America, Africa, Asia, they will witness different sorts of enlightenment. Okay, but. The kind of instrumental rationality, goal oriented, purpose oriented social action, objective oriented social action that we 
try to understand okay and positivism provided us with this kind of a framework then the second tenet that we we discussed that is methodological monism okay that there is only one method common to all sciences irrespective of their subject matter then we discussed inductivism that the method of science is the method of induction then we discussed systematic verifiability that the hallmark of science consists in the fact that uh, all scientific statements must be systematically verifiable then we discussed how observations are or can be shown pure okay in the sense that observations are theory independent in the positivistic schema okay and then we said observations as observations are pure they cannot be doubted they are indubitable in nature there is always a one way relationship there is always a unilateral relationship between observation and theory that observation leads to theory formation whereas theory formation doesn't lead to observation in the positivistic schema then we discussed fact value dichotomy that facts uh, do not have any uh, value content and me i mean they are value neutral whereas values do not have any factual content there is always a dichotomy between fact and value um, if i say uh, as i gave you the example that uh, 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 this is a laptop this is a fact if i say this laptop looks beautiful or ugly then i add value to it okay that's why this whether the laptop looks beautiful or ugly doesn't come under the purview of science okay it is very important to understand this phenomenon okay science always believes in facts whether this is this is a laptop this is a fact but no value commitments that's why science as the paradigm as you, as you, as the paradigm of, as you, one of the paradigms of knowledge production doesn't uh, ad, uh, adhere to any uh, value commitments okay Th that's why and then all explanation must involve deduction Uh, as we have discussed i mean uh, now now in a very in a nutshell we'll see uh, and then we discussed how observations presuppose theory and the counterpoints to uh, uh, this kind of proposition uh, which positivists made that how observations do not i mean i mean observations presuppose theory as well as the the uh, counter arguments uh, to observations presuppose theory okay i mean both uh, uh, i mean observations presuppose theory as it was propagated by the positivists then we'll see how uh, it was uh, we also discussed how uh, uh, it was uh, 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 i mean a critique was uh, brought about Th there we we discussed how uh, no observation is presuppositionless observation is always theory laden precisely because whenever whatever observations that we make okay it always involves some amount of some element of selection on what basis we select selection is based on cultural relevance as weber said it when i say uh, uh selection is based on cultural relevance and and then my observations are not independent my observations are not pure they are always backed by certain cultural um, artifacts certain uh, ideology certain uh, theory then when i then then we have al also discussed how observation doesn't provide us with a language or idiom for expression whereas theory provides us with a language or an uh, or an idiom for expression that's on account of which we we discussed how observations or no observation is presuppositionless okay as positivists thought this argument 
against positivism was bolstered by, was strengthened by Karl Popper. Okay? Before discussing, before starting the discussion on Popperian methodology, okay, let us quickly see what are the steps that inductivism, uh, hypothesism and positivism they follow. Okay? Inductivism starts with observational data, I mean inductivism suggests that science must start with observational data without recourse to any theory, observational data, this is very important. Step 2, we must provide a tentative generalization which requires verification and then we come to, uh, uh, we, we tend to formulate a law, that is the third step. If I say observational data, okay, I tend to observe, I will say that uh, no Socrates is mortal. Then what kind of tentative generalization I uh, will uh, provide? I will say Socrates is a man, which requires verification. Socrates may be a sheep, may be a tiger, may, I do not know. That is why that that Socrates is a man has to be verified, this is very important. If I can verify that, then, then I tend to formulate that law. Okay? In the context of that these are the three steps. In hypothesis, hypothesis argue that science always starts with a hypothesis. What is a hypothesis? It is a tentative solution to a problem or hunch, if you look at this. Okay? And if it is a tentative solution to a problem or, or hunch, what we generally do? We generally tend to test our hypothesis, whether it is right or wrong. In research, what, uh, uh, what we notice uh, in general, that's, that uh, 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 most of the, the scholars, they try to prove or disprove their hypothesis which is ethically wrong. You should test your hypothesis whether it is right or wrong. Hypothesis should be tested right or wrong. Hypothesis should not be proved or disproved. If one is die hard in proving or disproving his or her hypothesis, then it hinders the tradition of cumulative knowledge production. If you are die hard in proving or disproving your hypothesis, then you will try to manipulate the data which uh, is not advisable, which is uh, scorned, which uh, is not ethically correct to do in research. And once a, a, a hypothesis is tested right or wrong, if it is a wrong one, then we must reject it, okay? uh, we must reject the hypothesis and if the hypothesis is tested right then we must accept this in the hypothesis schema. In the positivistic schema, we must science must start with observation. Then from that observation, the second step depicts how we can arrive at a set of laws. The third step, I mean a set of laws in the form of premise number 1. Okay? The third step suggests a set of statements describing initial conditions you can see here okay i mean the premise number 1 a set of laws premise number 2 a set of statements describing initial conditions and the kind of conclusion that we make that a statement i mean that this is the explanation in the form of a statement describing the phenomenon to be explained. That is why we say all men are mortal. Okay? And this positivistic construal of science okay, was most systematically attacked by Karl Popper, okay, who was very much influenced by Max Weber, okay? I mean the Vienna school. Um, uh, we also say Verstehen school of thought, Verstehen 
means uh, understanding okay in german language this the such positivistic construal of science was most systematically attacked by karl popper okay karl popper who provided an alternative image of science his theory of scientific method has won a lot of admirers both in science as well as philosophy okay that's why i said you know, uh, earlier that the science is natural philosophy and the way philosophy uh, 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 i mean ethics uh, uh, when ethics was uh, combined with uh, natural philosophy i mean that epistemology then it became philosophy of science that's why i mean science and philosophy i mean natural philosophy and moral philosophy okay whereas positivists tried to work out a sophisticated version of the view called inductivism popper sought to resurrect its rival namely hypothesis in what follows we shall consider popper's views on the nature of sciences along with his attack on the positivistic theory of science it might be pointed out uh, uh, that for popper the value of the philosophical interest in scientific knowledge lies in its ability to shed light on the central question of philosophy then what is the central question of philosophy for popper now the problem of cosmology what is the problem of cosmology now the problem of understanding the world including ourselves and our knowledge of the world as part of the world i mean if if we want to understand the world we cannot be isolated phenomena we must be a part of the world to understand the world and the changes which occur in that occur there in studying popper's contribution to our understanding of science one must bear in mind his general philosophical concerns which alone set in motion guide and lend deep significance to his painstaking work on the nature of science okay this is an important question then uh, for popper what is the starting point of philosophy what is the problem of philosophy you know the problem of cosmology okay and such philosophical inquiry into the nature of scientific method according to popper must confine itself to the manner in which scientific theories are evaluated when i say uh, evaluated i mean scientific theories are accepted or rejected and popper refuses to consider uh, as legitimate the inquiry into the way in which these theories are arrived at therefore according to popper philosophy of science must first confine itself to the context of uh, justification and refuse to say uh, anything about the context of discovery what is this context of justification and context of discovery we'll see popper considers the creative process in and through which scientific ideas are generated to be unamendable to any rational explanation this is the first one then the what is the how did we start the the problem of cosmology i mean the central question of philosophy that is the problem of cosmology and the first one he referred to that that uh, philosophy of science must confine itself to the context of justification not the context of discovery initially okay secondly what what kind of an adequate philosophy of science that uh, that must provide a criterion of demarcation between science and non science you see uh, inductivists hypothesists as well as positivists okay they always try to make a demarcation between science and non science popper also didn't deviate from that like positivists popper is convinced of the uniqueness and supremacy of science in the overall scheme of our activities aimed at 
knowledge acquisition. What are these? Uh, what are these methods? There we have already discussed. If you can remember, if you can slightly recall, what we have discussed uh, about the methods. Uh, I mean, technical methods in the context of uh, ethos of science that empirically confirmed and logically consistent statements of regularities. Okay. Perhaps for this reason, knowledge seeking, I mean perhaps for this reason, science is uh, unique and supreme as compared to other spheres of human activity or creativity. Okay. Hence, both positivists and Popper felt the need to demarcate science from the rest of knowledge acquisition activity. Okay. That is why positivists who were inductivists maintained that the hallmark of scientific theory lies in their systematic verifiability. We will come to this point a little while later. Why I said that uh, there, there is a need to demarcate okay, science from the rest of knowledge acquisition activities. Other spheres of human activity or creativity that, uh, that uh, I mean other, other forms of knowledge ac acquisition activities we may see see that uh, how they they believe in or they they, they, they believe in uh, the observable facts science also believes in observable facts but the theological stage the metaphysical stage the proponents of theological stage the proponents of metaphysics they did not the proponents of theology as well as the proponents of metaphysics they did not believe in the verifiable facts. Whereas, science not only starts with observable facts, but also verifiable facts. Whatever I observe, it I must be able to verify. Okay? And positivists argued in that favor. Okay? In this context, Popper deviated from verification, we will come to this point a little while later. If I put a stick in a glass of water, the stick looks bent, but actually the stick is not bent. It only appears to be bent, but actually it is not bent. Okay? That is why Singh is believing that whatever I see, I must believe in that. It has its own limits. Okay? As positivists argued that no, whatever we see, we must believe in that. And Positivists argued that uh, and but that Singh is believing, okay. but there is a limitation that whatever I see, I, I may not believe because of why the stick looks bent because of the physical properties of uh, uh, glass, because of the reflection, uh, so many other things. Okay. I mean, image. If I say that I have seen a ghost, if I say this, then I am just observing something. I may observe something, but it is beyond the principle of verification. If I am observing, I am seeing a ghost, then others must also be seen, able to see ghost. It must be verified. Okay? Maybe, as I provided some kind of explanation, why the, the stick in a, in a glass of water uh, uh, looks bent, I may say that uh, that the maybe the psychological state of mind uh, forced me to see that kind of a phenomenon in the uh, so called the uh, it is called ghost. Okay, that's why there is a need to demarcate science from non-science in this sense. And positivists always argued that that the hallmark of scientific theories lies in their systematic verifiability. You have to keep on verifying. If I say all swans are white, then I must be able to verify all swans. Okay, that is what uh, hypothesis challenged uh, inductivists as we have uh, discussed earlier. That Are you sure that you have seen all swans in the world to come to a conclusion that all swans are white? You cannot keep on accumulating your observations, there is always a limitation. I mean, there is always a limiting condition 
under which we say all swans are white or all crows are black that that is a limitation then that is why positivists who were inductivists maintained that the hallmark of scientific theories lies in their systematic verifiability and popper come uh, popper comes to uh, the main point here that that popper replaces verifiability by falsifiability according to popper if if for positivists the hallmark of scientific theories lies in their systematic verifiability according to popper the hallmark of scientific theories lies in their systematic falsifiability popper Pop, popper maintains that what distinguishes science from the rest of our knowledge is not that scientific statements are verifiable but they are falsifiable the scientific theories are falsifiable according to popper in the sense that they transparently state what circumstances lead to their rejection under what circumstances our scientific theories are accepted and under that that is that was the job that that, that was the view of inductivists hypothesists and positivists whereas for popper under what circumstances our scientific theories are rejected refuted that is important if we if we keep on testing our if we keep on accumulating our observations to support our theory then there is no progression of science we must keep on accumulating our observations our our uh, observational statements our uh, experiences our uh, circumstances our conditions so that a, an existing theory may be put to test may be may be rejected in its entirety and thereby science can make progress if i keep on support to keep on collecting data to support a theory then there is actually no progression of knowledge for popper for popper science or we we tend to go ahead with the furtherance of knowledge only when we try to challenge the the hitherto existing theories then that's why it is important for popper to make a distinction uh, between science and non science okay and the distinction is uh, uh, is preferred and what makes this kind of distinction uh, possible not just because they are verifiable but because scientific statements are falsifiable and the and the scientific uh, theories are falsifiable in the sense that they transparently state what circumstances lead to their rejection whenever scientific theories are advanced it is always it is also stated under what conditions they try to be they they they, they uh, turn out to be false so that we try to obtain those conditions in order to falsify our claims it is very important to create conditions to support your scientific claim anybody does this i mean almost uh, most of the scientists they do that but a very few scientists those who have uh, i mean practitioners I mean, a critical mind they will say that no let us falsify our claims and let us create those conditions which can falsify our uh, uh, scientific claims okay this is very important and uh, and in fact there is a progression of knowledge because of this and an ideal scientific statement is constituted in such a way that it turns instead of helping to survive enable it to uh, readily accept the risk of being falsified in other words a model of scientific statement should readily yield test implications which we deduce in order to refute it refutation is very important a statement however plausible 
and perfectly consistent with what we observe is not scientific unless we can easily deduce testable uh, consequences from it. It is in this connection Popper attacks Marxism as being pseudo scientific. In fact, uh, uh, if you read uh, uh, the open society and its enemies by Karl Popper, Popper challenged three uh, 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 three uh, historical personalities, uh, namely Darwin, Marx, and Freud. Okay, precisely because the way you tend to criticize or uh, the the way you try to bring about a critique to Darwin, Marx, or Freud, okay, the proponents of Darwin, Marx, and Freud they create walls so that you cannot uh, 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 bring about a critic, you cannot foreground a critic, which which hinders the tradition of cumulative knowledge. In this sense, we are using. Okay, but if you look at the second volume of the Open Society and its enemies, okay, uh, Popper himself creates walls to protect D Darwin, uh, Marx, as well as Freud. Okay. Uh, that is not a part of this course right now, but this one is very important. I mean a statement however plausible and perfectly consistent with what we observe is not scientific uh, unless we can easily deduce testable consequences from it. In this connection it is uh, pseudo scientific, uh, it is also uh, I mean in this con it is in this connection that Popper attacks Marxism as being pseudo scientific. Okay, in this sense, when Marx propounded his theory of, for example, where when Marx propounded his theory of capitalist society, his theory was a falsifiable theory because it yielded test implications such as disappearances of middle class, revolution in advanced industrial societies, and so on. However, for according to Popper, these test implications were not borne out, and hence the theory was falsified. But the followers of Marx tried to explain the fact that the Marxist predictions did not come about by taking recourse to ad hoc explanations and thus insisted that there was nothing wrong in with the theory. In this process, they went on building safety valves for the theory with the result that the theory becomes un unfalsifiable, which is false under um, uh, the purview of being pseudo scientific. Again, a religious theory, a religious theory about the world is of course also unfalsifiable, but the propounders of religious theories about the world never claim scientificity for their views, whereas Marxists do it do so vehemently. Religion says that no, uh, I mean the proponents of religion they suggest that no, we, we do not believe in science. That, no, that is not uh, we we are not we are, we don't claim uh, our our. Uh, world to be scientific, but Marxists always claim, Marxists vehemently claim that no, our theory is scientific. Hence, Marxist theory is not merely unfalsifiable for Popper and therefore unscientific, but also pseudo scientific. It is this pretension to be scientific while being unfalsifiable makes the theory pseudo scientific okay? for, for Popper. Okay, in, in the first volume of the open society and its enemies. In accordance with what Popper considers to be the hallmark of scientific theories, he puts forward the adequate model of scientific method. I mean, what, what kind of thing that we are getting till now? That, that if a theory is unfalsifiable, then it is not scientific. A theory must be falsifiable because we do not have we do not tend to create universal theory. That is why for, for Popper, I mean in accordance with what Popper considers to be the hallmark of scientific theories, he puts forward an adequate model of scientific method. He characterizes his model of scientific method as the hypothetical deductive model. We call it HD model, okay. not high definition model, but hypothetical deductive model. Okay. Now, now present generation perhaps. Uh, uh, perhaps look uh, perhaps uh, uh, looks at high definition but i am not referring to that i am i am referring to popperian hypothetical deductive model and according to popper the method of science okay 
is not the method of induction that from particular instances to arrive at a concrete generalization, but rather the method of science is the method of hypothetical deduction. Okay? What we say deduction actually deduction I mean it always starts with a hypothesis that is why he said it is, uh, it, it is a method of hypothetical deduction. Then what are the fundamental differences between these methodological models? Okay? First, the inductivist model as we have already discussed maintains that our observations are theory independent. Also positivists also maintain that uh, our observations are uh, theory independent and therefore, uh, are indubitable. That is to say, since observations are theory independent, they have probability value of 1. That we always start with observation that is, uh, uh, I mean observations are presuppositionless, observations are theory independent. We do not. For it also says, when I, I mean uh, uh, inductivists, positivists, they also say that, uh, that whatever theories that we have, they are always winnowed from observations and therefore, our scientific theories have the initial probability value 1 in principle. Of course, inductivists admitted that in actual practice theories may contain something more than what observation statements indicate the result. Our actual theories uh, may not have been winnowed from observations. Hence, the need for verification arises. Okay. That is why positivists also argued that the, the hallmark of scientific theory is uh, lies in their systematic verifiability, which Popper rejects the inductivist view that our observations are theory free. Popper rejects this view that the, they are theory independent, no observations are not theory independent. And hence, he rejects the idea that our observation statements have probability uh, equal to 1. Okay. For Popper, observations are always theory laden observations, uh, no observation, whatever observations that we make, okay, they are not presuppositionless. Okay. And more importantly, what Popper maintains that theories are not we note from observations or facts, but are free creations of human mind. Our scientific ideas, uh, in other words, are not extracted from our observations, they are pure inventions for Popper for Popper. Since our theories are our own constructions, not the functions of anything like pure observations, which according to Popper are anyway myths, the initial probability of our scientific theories is 0. Okay? I mean he was quite open. Okay? This is where he deviated from positivists and deductivists. From this, what it follows? I mean from this it follows that Whereas, according to inductivists, what scientific uh, tests do is to merely find out whether our scientific theories are true. For Popper, on the other hand, scientific tests cannot establish the truth of scientific theories, even when the, the tests give positive results. If a test gives a positive result, inductivists claim that or uh, positive, uh, even positivists uh, claim that the scientific theory is established as true, whereas according to Popper, all that we claim is that our theory has not yet been falsified. Because we have collected only those data to support our theory. Popper suspects even that the sun always rises in the east. Uh, in Popper's schema, no amount of positive result of scientific testing can prove our theories and uh, that is a different matter whether sun rises, uh, the sun always rises in the east or not. Uh, if you look at uh, the Copernican revolution, I mean uh, earlier Ptolemy said in astronomy uh, that uh, no earlier notion I mean before prior to Copernican revolution in astronomy that uh, no uh, the sun moves and the planets especially the earth. Okay? they remain constant. That is why uh, at that time the powers that be including the kings and emperors, okay, they used to have this notion called the sun rises in the east as if the sun moves around the planets. No, rather the planets move around the sun. 
that is why uh, Copernicus, um, Galileo they, they objected and uh, they had to face virulent criticisms uh, from the powers that be. But uh, such was the uh, such was the uh, 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 strength of such such rejection of the powers that be that today we can say that this is a this is an erroneous statement that the sun rises in the east. Uh, maybe we will say that no, the, the horizon sets in the east. I mean that part of the earth which faces towards the sun becomes day, that part of the, the earth which does not face towards the sun becomes night. That is why the horizon sets in the east, not the sun rises in the east. That is a different story altogether, but, but in this context, in the context of Popper uh, that uh, even if I say that the horizon sets in the east or the sun rises in the east, okay, no amount of positive result and on a daily basis we witness this that uh, we will say that you know this is day, this is night, uh, this is how uh, the, 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 the orbits uh, uh, work, the, the planets work, sun works, so this, this is how, uh, but, but for Popper no amount of repetition, no amount of positive result, no amount of accumulation of uh, observational data of scientific testing can prove our theories. Whereas, inductivists speak of confirmation of our theories in the face of positive results of the test, Popper only speaks of corroboration. In other words, in the, in the inductivist scheme, we can speak of scientific theories as established truths, whereas in the Popperian schema, a scientific theory however well supported by evidence remains permanently tentative. We can bring out the fundamental difference between verificationism propounded by inductivism as well as positivism as well as uh, and on, on the one hand and falsificationism propounded by hypothetical deductivism on the other by drawing on the analogy between the two systems of criminal law, okay? between two systems of criminal law.